So, last time that we were together, we looked at the authority of God's Word and His authority over us through His Word. And we talked about the doctrine of sola scriptura and how one of the key doctrines for the reformers in their battle, in their challenge to the tradition and the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church. Not only does the Word of God have authority, but the Word of God is also sufficient for you, for us as believers. The reality of our lives is that we have many different sources of information, constantly bombarding us from many different directions. TV, books, podcasts, radio, magazines, internet, etc. All these things vie for our attentions. And add to these suggestions from friends, from family, work colleagues. And all these can leave us confused even. How do we live out our lives as Christians? How do we process the vast amounts of information that we have access to every day? How do we appraise the world around us and live for God? What does the Bible say about the topics of today? Is the Bible applicable in our modern context? Is God's Word all we need? You see, as believers, we, we come to the truth of Scripture and we must submit to its authority. But I want you to see that the Scriptures also have everything we need for spiritual life and godliness. We have everything we need in this world. Doesn't mean we shouldn't seek to grow in our understanding of the world around us. It doesn't mean that God hasn't put people in our lives that are important for us, that minister to us. But it means we look for the Word of God as our sole authority and sufficient for our lives. I read of this man in the UK not too long ago that he tried to change his newborn's date of birth and time of birth. The child was born on December 31st at 11.05 p.m. And when the nurse handed him the documents to fill out, the official forms, he changed the date to January 1st, 12.05 a.m. He said, quote, one hour difference wasn't really a problem, end quote. Well, the nurse, of course, said that this was unacceptable and handed him back the documents and told him to put the right date and time. Well, he, he refused. He said, look, I, I want my son to be born in this year, not the previous year. Of course, the nurses took the form away from him and put in the correct date and said, you know, you can't forge official documents. This is false information. This isn't true. Well, brother, just because someone says something or someone speaks with authority and has a learning, it doesn't mean that it's true. You see, every person interprets the world around them with certain presuppositions. What are yours? Right? Do you filter the world around you through the lens of Scripture? And that's what we're we'll looking at today. Scripture is sufficiency for us as believers. And really, there are three aspects of sufficiency that I want to look at this morning. We're going to be looking at God's Word versus lies in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. We're going to be looking at God's Word, and it is good for you in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And then we're going to be looking at God's Word in how we appraise all things in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So a few passages this morning. So if you have your Bibles with me, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. 
Genesis chapter 2. And I want to start by looking at an aspect of sufficiency of Scripture, but that God's word versus lies. God's word versus lies. So in order to establish, first of all, God, sorry, God first of all establishes his order. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so one of the things I just want to establish to start with is that God as creator establishes his order of authority. You see, God created man, so God is over man. And then as we learn in Genesis chapter 2, God creates woman from man. And so when it comes down to God's created order, you have God over man, man over woman, and and man and woman over creation. That's God's established order. This is the headship principle of Scripture, and this is repeated throughout Scripture. Paul repeats this principle in 1 Corinthians 11 when he he talks about order in the church. He repeats this principle in Ephesians 5 when he talks about order in the family. He repeats this principle in 1 Timothy 2.12 when he talks about order in church leadership. You see, creation is subservient to man. And the reason I want to establish this is because God also gives instructions to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. Look over Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any of the tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for it. For the day which you eat for it you will surely die. So God gave specific truth, specific instructions to Adam. And notice he said, eat freely. Right? We see God's goodness. Eat all you want. It's a buffet. Right? Eat freely. Don't worry about it. No conscious issues here. Right? Except for one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was God's command. And God, even in his graciousness, told them the consequences. He said, if you eat from it, you will die. You see, they had what they needed. God's clear, excuse me, God's clear command to carry out their responsibilities. So when we think about sufficiency of Scripture, Scripture is sufficient for every believer of all time to carry out the responsibilities that God has given us. God has given them, excuse me, and us as well. Every believer of all time has had sufficient revelation from God to be obedient to Him and live a righteous life in every age. Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Moses, the Israelites, right? And then the church. We have what we need to carry out our responsibilities. Scripture is sufficient. God has given you what you need. God gave Adam and Eve what they needed to know. What they needed to do to be obedient. Deuteronomy 4. Moses says this to the Israelites. He says, Deuteronomy 4. He says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord God, the God of your fathers, has given you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, so that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you. So they have what they need. He even says in verse 9, he said, Only give heed to yourself, And keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and grandsons. (laughs) So they had what they needed. They had what they needed to be obedient. 
But for us as believers, as, as the church, we are to what? Live obedience in what we know. We have the full and final revelation of God. We have even more word. We have even more truth than what Adam and Abraham had. But I want you to see, not only do we have God's truth and what God has established, but we also have Satan opposing God's order. And this is key, because you have God's word, you have God's truth, and you have lies in this world. And look at verse, or look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You should not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden you may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so, not only has God established His order, He's given man His word, His truth, but you see this contrast between two words. You see the word of God is very specific to Adam. And then you have Satan come along, and Satan says something very different. You see, Satan wants to upend God's order. You know this, he, he takes possession of a serpent, of an animal. He comes to Eve, apart from her husband, and then Eve goes to Adam. So if you think about it, God's created order is God, man, woman, and man and woman over creation. Here you have creation, animal over woman, woman over man, and then man over God in the created order. But Satan speaks to Eve. And what does Satan do? Satan does the same strategies today that he does with Eve. He attacks God's word. He questions the existence of God's word. He said, did God really say? Did God really say this? Right, because if God didn't say it, is it binding upon you? But we see this today. Theological liberals. You see this, from, even outside of theological liberals, you see this from people. Did God really say this? Is this really God's word? Is it full of errors? Or is it just a human book full of history? I need to pursue the historical Jesus. Or, or let's, not, let's not listen to anything except for the red letters in Scripture. Do, do I have to really, really trust that this is God's Word? If it's not God's Word, then guess what? It is not binding upon us. That's why people are so fond of attacking Scripture. Because if Scripture is not inerrant, if it's not the truth of God, then it's not binding upon us. And that's what Satan says. Satan says, look, did God really say? You can imagine, I can almost imagine Eve made a face. Like, huh? Because Satan then verts to a different strategy, and he says, well, I'll just completely contradict God's word. He says in verse 4, you surely will not die. Don't worry about the consequences. What God has said will not happen. Don't worry, don't be any consequences. Right. We hear this today as well. It's the same strategy. People approach God's word and, and they read it and they go, well, you know, I admit, I see that that's God's word or I see that that's good morals, but mm, will a loving God really send someone to hell? Mm, yeah, I don't really believe there's consequences. Right? So you say it's attacking God's word. You have a, a battle between the truth of God versus the lies, plural, of Satan. You see, Satan tempted Eve. And the temptation for Eve was that she would evaluate and appraise God's word autonomously. From God, that she would stand in judgment on God's word, that she would look at the circumstance she was in, and she would evaluate those circumstances, and she only had a choice. 
Is she going to believe God or believe Satan? Well, Satan wanted her to evaluate it independently, to appraise the situation, to set herself above the truth, per se, and decide what is best for her. In other words, Satan said, you'll be like God. You'll be autonomous. You'll be able to make your own decisions based off your own reason without being bound to anything else. God makes his own decisions. God makes his own choices. He works according to his will. Satan says, you'll be like God. You'll be like this. And he challenged Eve to do that, to live autonomously outside of her her God-given head, which is husband, to make her own decisions, to disregard God's word. And she did. She did. You see, Satan's desire for that today. And that's what everybody else loves. Right? I'm autonomous. I can make decisions on my own. How dare you tell me that there's a God and there's absolute truth? How intolerant of you. What's interesting with Eve is she had no basis of comparison. She only had God's word and Satan's lies. And so the question is, is it truth or is it not? And if it's truth, we believe it and we submit to it and we follow it. We know that God has given it to us and it's good for us. And then Eve fell and man fell. And Eve looked at the fruit and it was the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, as John says, 1 John. She said it. It looked good. It was good for food. It was delight to the eyes. It was desirable to make one wise. And she took it. And she believed the lies of Satan, rather the truth of God's word, and she ate. She trusted in her own judgment to evaluate the truth of what God has said. She believed the expert testimony, contradicting God's word, and she ate. And she fell. She judged wrongly. And she disobeyed. And this says she gave to her husband an eight. What's interesting though, verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3 gives us a little more insight. It says, because these are God's word to Adam. It says to Adam, he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. God, Adam listened to the word of his wife versus the word of God. And he fell. Adam made his own choice. He listened to an opposing voice, opposing word. I love, I love how God comes to them and, and look, they, they have no expectation of grace. Right? They don't know what grace is. All they're, all they're expecting, all, all that they would even reasonably expect from God is judgment. So they hide themselves in fear. And God comes to them. And God asked Adam and Eve, he said, who told you you were naked? Right? It's not that God didn't know. God is being said rhetorically. Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you? And the woman whom you, and Adam, uh, verse 12, notice we, we always say that Adam blames Eve. But if you look carefully at verse 12, who does he blame? The woman you gave me. Adam blames God. Right? God, it's your fault. I was doing fine. I was doing great until you see this woman here. Right? Be careful, guys. Don't apply that the wrong way. Right? I was doing great. It's your fault, God. Right? I, I, I faced this temptation. That's what James says in James chapter 2. Let no one say when they are tempted it is from God, because God doesn't send evil. God sends good. How many times you're in a circumstance and you go, oh, oh Lord, I, I, it's your fault. I, I shouldn't even been in this situation. Adam blames Eve. And Eve says the serpent's fault. The serpent deceived me, which is true. And then we have the wages of sin. Right? You guys know the wages of sin. The curses upon Adam and Eve, Right? Their bodies are affected. They die. They grow old. Right? They face death. Right? Their, their, their environment is infected. The earth we live in, the earth they lived in, is under a curse. Their relationship is affected. 
Eve's desire now be to dominate her husband? That we now battle the sexes as the husband, instead of lovingly leading his wife, God says, you're going to try to lord it over your wife, and she's going to battle against your authority? And this is the natural state of the sinful human heart. It's going to affect their relationship. And not only that, they're in a spiritual battle. In Genesis 3.15, we have the early gospel where God says, a seed of woman is going to crush the head of Satan. They're going to be in a spiritual battle. But as we get ready to move on to the next point, I want you to see that God gives them grace, right? He did not kill them instantly, which is what they deserved. He showed them grace. And what did God do? God says, well, you, you'll still enjoy the fruit of your labor. It's going to be hard work. There's still going to be children, but it's going to be painful, right? You still get to live, but you will die. But you know what? I'm also, through your offspring, I'm going to bring a Messiah. Well, it's a Messiah, I'm going to bring a Savior who's going to crush the head of Satan and redeem this world, Genesis 3.15. So God gives him grace. And they responded how? They responded in belief. Look at verse 20 of chapter 3. This is how they respond to God's word this time. Now the man called his wife's name Eve. I don't know if you guys have a little note along Eve's name. And at the bottom, it means life. Right? Adam believed God's word that life, redemption, would come through their offspring. He could have very well named his wife death. Right? But he named her after the fall. Eve. And Eve believed God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Right? She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with who? With the help of the Lord. Right? She understood that God was providing children. It's part of his promise. They wouldn't die. That There would be offspring. There wouldn't be a continuation of the human race. That their sin wouldn't be it. So they believed. So God's word prevailed. Brother, only God's word prevails. And they believed God this time. They didn't rebel. They accepted his grace and they accepted his judgment. And ultimately, brother, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Will you accept God's word and trust him in all areas of your life? Or will you believe and accept something that stands in opposition to the truth, the lies of Satan? Who wants you to doubt the veracity of God's word, its truthfulness. I want you to doubt that God's word is his word. This text today, they're not, they're not changed. Right? They've become more systematized, indirect at times, but the texts are still the same. That's one of the major themes of scripture, the truth of God versus the lies of Satan. You see, God's given his word to guide us into a life to honoring him. And he's given us what we need at this moment to live out a godly life. You don't have to be a seminary student. You don't have to have walked with the Lord for 20 years. He's given you what you need in this moment to live a godly life. Now, do we grow? Yes. Right? But he's given you the responsibility. He's given you what you need to fulfill the responsibilities. And the great thing about God's word is it's good for us. And that's the second point. Flip all the way over to the New Testament, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. So not only is God's word, you have to, when you look at sufficiency of scripture, you have to look at the fact that it's God's word versus lies, the lies of Satan. But you also have to know that God's word is good for you. God's word is good for you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul's talking to Timothy here at the end of his life. He's writing to Timothy, he's a pastor of the church of Ephesus. Final, final writings to Timothy. What is he saying? He says, look, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Right. So scripture, as we've discussed now over the last couple of days, scripture is given by God. 
Right? The word here for inspired is God breathed. God spoke it into existence. Its origin is from God, not through men alone. Now, the Holy Spirit used human agencies, prophets, apostles, used these men to write his word. But God's word is his word. His origin is from God. We see that in the Old Testament. I, I love this thought. Look at verse 14. He's talking to Timothy, and he says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing them from whom you've learned, and that from your that from childhood, from childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We know in Acts 16 that Timothy's father was a Greek. We also know also in 2 Timothy that Timothy learned the scriptures through his mother and his grandmother. Ladies, you have tremendous influence over your children's lives and helping them to understand the truth. Timothy learned the Old Testament. Grandmothers, you have a tremendous amount of influence over your children's life and teaching them the scriptures. Because you're retired, quote unquote, doesn't mean you can't have an influence in your family's life. And then Paul is near death. So when he talks about scripture being from God, he's, he's talking about the Old Testament. But here Paul's near death. He's in the end of his life. He's writing this to Timothy. He's also thinking about his own writings. And Peter affirms that Paul's writings are scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, Paul says the unstable, or excuse me, Peter says the unstable distort all the scriptures, including the writings of Paul. He equates Paul's writings, his letters with scripture, the New Testament, the Old Testament. It's all from God. But you know what? It's, it's beneficial. He says all scripture is inspired by God and profitable. If I told you today you could invest $10 and you have a 100% guarantee of getting $1,000 back, you would sign up in an instant, right? We all would. 100% guarantee, right? That's a profitable venture, right? That's a beneficial venture. Well, that's the word here. Profitable is, is highly valuable. It's worth it. Paul's saying that scripture is inspired. He says it's profitable, it's beneficial, it's worth it, it's good for you. And then he goes on to say there's, there's really, there's four ways that it's beneficial. He says it's beneficial for teaching, right, for doctrine. Doctrine is just what this Bible teaches about any given topic. Sin. Man. Your purpose in this world. Your future. Eschatology. Christ. Right? God. So theology. Theology is study of God. Right? So it's, it's beneficial. It's, it's good for you for teaching so you understand truth. It's also beneficial in that it reproves us. Right? The word there for reproof is, is correction, refuting error. Remember, I was younger, I was in Bible college, and I'm, I'm you know, just a young skull full of mush, and I'm, I'm learning and learning, and I, you know, I have this mistaken idea that the Holy Spirit's a power. Then I remember reading the scriptures, and, and one day, it, it just the Holy Spirit hit me. Uh, the Holy Spirit just showed me very clearly, He is not an it. Right? The scriptures reprove us, they correct us, they, they show us the error of our, of our ways and our thoughts about God and His Word, but it, they also reprove us by exposing sin. I think in my own life, and many times God's convicted me through His Word over specific areas in my life that, that are sin that I haven't even thought about being sin. But it also... It's beneficial in correcting us. The idea of correction is, is, is a restoration to a proper state. So God's Word doesn't just teach us. It doesn't just reprove us and leave us feeling guilty. But the goal of God's Word is that it would correct our behavior and lead us to a greater repentance and a greater, what, faith in Christ. And then it's beneficial for what? Training in righteousness. Right? The Bible teaches us, helps us to understand how to live righteously? How, how do you please God? People say, well, I want to please God. How do I please God?
please God. Well, the Bible helps us to, to train us in what is right, what is morally acceptable. It's beneficial. So God's word is good for you, and it has a purpose. Paul even says, he says, so that, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The man of God here, he, he means it in a, in a general sense. He's talking to, to Timothy specifically, the man of God. But it applies broadly as well, any man of God or any woman of God. And the purpose is that you would be what? That you would be adequate. I don't like the English word. I don't like English translation there, adequate. Huh? You know, would you say that about your wife? Well, she's adequate. She's adequate. Don't do that, guys. Right? I don't like that. The English translation is just kind of bland, right? It's one of those words over time has become less powerful. It's just adequate, right? Well, the, the word of the Greek carries a lot more meaning. It means, it means complete, mature. So the word of God is beneficial to you, but the purpose of the word of God is so that you would be mature, that you would be able to handle all the demands of your life in every moment. Right? That's a lot, that's a lot better definition than adequate. Mature, complete, perfect. And then he says, not only would you be mature, but you would be equipped, right? I love, this is a great word in the Greek, equipped. When you guys got ready for camp, what did you do? You loaded up your car. You had your checklist. I need my, need my uh, beanie. I need my warm socks. I need my sleeping bag. Next year, I'm bringing you more blankets. You, know, you have all these things in your mind. You have your list, your check. What are you doing? You're equipping yourself for this trip. That's the same idea in the scriptures. You're equipping, your, you're equipping yourself for a journey. You're being outfitted and supplied with everything you need for your life to handle every situation. That's scripture. That's the purpose. So that you would be mature and that you would be able to live a life honoring to, honoring to God in any and every situation that you may face. That you are fitted out and ready. So it's, it's good for you. Well, that's true. What are, what are some conclusions that we can draw? Well, first of all, Scripture means, our Scripture has a magisterial role over our lives. In other words, Scripture is the full and final authority over our lives. Everything else must be in submission to Scripture. Does that mean, as the Church of Christ says, only Christ, no creeds? Is there anything else that's beneficial? Should we not listen to pastors and teachers? Should it just be you studying the scriptures on your own, camped out by yourself? What about books and podcasts and creeds and confessions, councils? Are these, are these something we should even think about? When we think about scripture, scripture is to have the magisterial role in that it governs all of our life, but there's a ministerial role for everything else. To be a minister is just simply one who guides and helps. Right? A shepherd, pastor, all the same words. It's what I am. It's what Benji and I are. Pete, we're all we're shepherds, we're elders, we're helps, we're guides. The same thing for councils, for creeds, for confessions. They help guide us in, in the development of our theology, in the development of our understanding of the truth. I mean, Ephesians 4, Paul says that Christ actually gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers as a, as a grace gift to his church so that, that you, we, would be equipped to do the work of the service. So all these things have a, a ministerial role, but they all are to be brought under the authority of Scripture. Like, I love the Westminster Confession. I love the London Baptist Confession. Right? Do I agree with everything in those? No. Right? I understand the presuppositions behind what they've, the decisions they've made on certain things. I don't hold a covenant of grace, a covenant of works, a covenant of redemption. I understand their presuppositions. I still can agree with about 95% in those confessions. And what they said is, is eloquently put out, and they give scriptural reasons behind those things. And those things are helpful. 
We've used those confessions with our kids and catechizing them and certain, uh, with some of those things. But ultimately, I say, well, do they match up with Scripture? And so in that sense, Scripture is beneficial for us, profitable, and it stands in authority of everything else. We won't, and I see we, me, and Benji and Pete, and God, want you to be Bereans, Acts 17. Paul came and preached the gospel. What did the Bereans do? They went to the scriptures to see if they're true. Right? How do you think cults get so uh, get, get formed and become popular because people show up and they just believe the guy who's preaching? I, I don't want you to just to believe me. I want, I'm here to help you by explaining the truth, but I want you to go to scripture. It is the magisterial authority of your life. It is it, the scriptures themselves, God's word, that are transforming your life. That's why good preaching is good for you because it's expository preaching. It's explaining the meaning of Scripture and challenging you guys to apply it and helping you apply it. Like I said, but it's still, it's still ministerial. It's still secondary to the truth. If I get up here and I preach the Scripture and I'm preaching wrongly, the Scripture still has power. Right? And you need to go, wow, I think we may have found a new church. Right? He's not being faithful to the Word. Because what? The Word stands over everything else. So Scripture communicates to us God's will, His nature. It gives us moral instructions. As I said yesterday, for those of you who weren't here, Scripture gives us precepts to live by. Right? Moral syllogisms. We, we say, well, the Word of God says, do not steal. It's something stealing is a sin. We, we're tempted to shoplift. And we go, well, shoplifting is stealing. Then shoplifting is a sin. Right? The Bible also has, uh, has points upon points. Right? Do not commit adultery. Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you, if you lust, you're committing adultery. Therefore, what? Lust is sin. The Scripture guides our life. God communicates His will for our lives. And He speaks to every person. People say, oh, the Word of God's not applicable to me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sparky. I'm a bummer. I'm a, I'm a mom, a homemaker, a worker at home, a, I'm a baker, right? God's Word doesn't speak to me. No, God's Word does speak to you. God's Word to every person. It is applicable for every person. Now, does God's Word tell you how to bake a cake step by step? No, you got cookbooks. Does God's Word tell an electrician how to change a light fixture step by step? No. But God's Word tells that Sparky how to live his life in, in honor to God and glorify Him. God tells, God in His Word tells that mom, hey, here's how you honor God in your marriage, in your family, with your kids. Here, baker, here's how you live your life in the context of your baker. God's Word speaks to each and every one of us. It's good for you. It's profitable. It's beneficial. Because God's purpose is for you to be mature. And fully equipped for every good work. So God's word is sufficient. We have to realize that there's a battle between God's word and the lies of Satan all around us. We have to understand that God's word is good for us. We also have to understand that scripture appraises all things. Look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's our last passage this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 10. Paul's been talking about the scripture. We've been talking about the gospel, how the gospel is not worldly wisdom, it's from God. And so in verse 10, when he talks about God has revealed them, he's talking about the truths of scripture. For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who on men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but we but the Spirit is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, 
and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For he has known the mind of the Lord, and that he will instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Okay? So the key part of this section is the word of praise. A word of praise. A word of praise is on a crena means to vigorously investigate, closely examine. In a forensic sense, I don't know how many of you guys like the CSI type shows that are on TV where they, they closely examine every detail and have some brick case. Well, this is the idea here, right? We're, we're closely examining what it says a natural man, he cannot closely examine, he cannot vigorously investigate and understand his world, verse 14, apart from the Spirit of God. He won't accept spiritual truth. So the conclusions that the natural man makes will be naturalistic. Right? Naturalistic. The wisdom is supernatural. And humanistic is the, is the focus of every conclusion that they draw. So natural person, an unsaved person, looks the world around him and he evaluates it and he appraises it apart from God and his truth. But unlike the natural man, verse 15, he who is spiritual, he who has been redeemed, as Paul's word likes that word, spiritual, he who has been redeemed, who is regenerated, who has come to Christ, he appraises, he evaluates all things in the light of the truth of God. Now, we are to learn about the world around us. I love watching, you know, those, uh, those David Attenborough DVDs, the, 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 what is it, Blue Planet and Live. And, I mean, they're well done, especially in HD. Beautiful, right? God's Word. I love watching. I love learning about the, the wonderful creation that God has given us and, and the intricacies of the, the molecular level and the, and the vastness of space, just, just the wonders. The heavens give glory and tell the glory of God. I love learning about that stuff. And that's called natural knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that's available to every one of us. It may require work and effort, but we are all people are able to learn about the natural world around them. Science, right? Math. It was, you even see this in the garden. I don't know if you ever thought about this. When God, as we just read in Genesis chapter 2, when God tells Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what does God assume that Adam knows? He knows what a tree is. He knows the difference between a fruiting tree and a non-fruiting tree. Making some assumptions that, that Adam would be have an understanding of the world around him. God brings all the animals to Adam to name. It's not just for nomenclature. It's for Adam would understand the differences of the different animals and their function in the world, but also to see that, that none of them were suitable as a helpmate. The dogs are great. It's very different from a wife. Right? God wants us to learn about the world around us. But we have to have spiritual discernment. And you know what the wonderful thing is? Verse 16, this is kind of a tucked in little line at the very end. But we have the mind of Christ. Realize that? We have the mind of Christ. We can think God's thoughts after him. Because we have his word. We have the Holy Spirit that helps us to discern the truth. So what do we do? And what is Paul saying here? He's talking to the Corinthians and he's saying, you guys love earthly wisdom and philosophy. Because Corinth thought of themselves as little Athens, by the way, contextually. So they loved human philosophy and they, and they had preachers that would come and, and philosophers that would set up soapboxes and they would gain a following and people would support them and they'd form little schools. They, they thought of themselves as a, as a philosophy center only rivaled by Athens. And, and he's saying to these believers, you love this philosophy, but look, you need to appraise, you need to evaluate closely the world you live in according to the truth because you can understand it now. 
And as we evaluate our world, you know, you go out, we, we look last night at the campfire, and we're looking at the full moon and the stars, and what do we do? We give glory to God. Because we can, we can evaluate it from a biblical perspective, a right perspective. We don't say, oh, wow, look at what evolved out of nothing over billions of years. But we evaluate. We analyze. We think. We evaluate the presuppositions of people. Everyone has presuppositions. Presuppositions are what people believe determines their actions and determines how they view data. So-called experts, uh, the longer you live, the more you see, you, you, you realize as people are talking, I start going, hmm. I listen to what they're saying, and I go, okay, what are their presuppositions? All right, wait, first of all, he's not a Christian, all right? So he doesn't have the Holy Spirit, so he's approaching things from a naturalistic standpoint. So every time he comes across data, he's going to interpret that data from his presuppositions, from his belief system. I had a professor, he was actually a Greek professor, he's great, but his, his, uh, his, he used to show us clips of the X-Files, and as a joke in class, was he was, he was question everything, question everything, right? Because he wanted us to think about what we believe, not only as a Christian, in theology sense, he wanted us to base our, our, our beliefs on the Word and not on tradition or creeds or councils, what does the Word say, but he also wanted us to look at the world around us and look, what are the presuppositions behind what people are saying with science and philosophy and history? I love history, and I can tell you, I've got, I've got two books at home. One's a, a people's history of the United States, and one's a patriot's history of the United States. And they're written from a liberal and a conservative standpoint. And the way they view history are, and, their, and the interpretations they make are very different based on their presuppositions. And those books they are on my shelf to remind me that history, everything is interpreted we appraise all things as Christians through the Word. The Word is the lens which we view all things. And that's why we develop a biblical worldview. So that what? The Word of God helps us to mature, but equips us to be able to understand the world around us and appraise and evaluate it. But we also have to apply it. I mentioned this yesterday. Just scriptural knowledge on its own doesn't equal maturity equals a Pharisee. Our kids learn a lot of truth in church. But apart from the grace of God, they're, they're growing to be Pharisees. They're going to know Scripture, but not submit to it. See, we have to have a soft heart towards Scripture. And I did mention this yesterday as an illustration, and it's true. I have run across so many PKs Pastor's kids and missionary kids. And I take this as a warning even for myself as a pastor through my interactions with a lot of university students. And, and they have a great knowledge of Scripture, but do they apply it? I remember this time I had to confront this girl about it, an integrity issue. Right? It was hard. When I hired her, she, uh, I needed work. I needed help during Christmas. It was the busiest season in the restaurant. When I worked in it, I was by vocational. I hired and I said specifically, look, if you can't work in Christmas time, I, I don't need you, right? I, that's what I'm looking for. I hired people a couple months ahead of time. She said, no, no, I'll be here, I'll be here, I'll be here. Christmas came, she came to me, she said, oh, my family wants me to go on holiday with them. I said, okay. I said, so did you tell your family you can't do it? She goes, no, 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 I won't go for my family. I told her, I said, well, you need to think about your integrity. You're a Christian, right? You need to think about it. Think about your integrity. Think about what you've promised. We do what is right, even if it costs us. And uh, and she, I said, go talk to your family. Came back. My, well, my dad said, I, I just need to quit. I said, okay. I said, you can sacrifice your integrity for your vacation. Right? You can have all the knowledge in the world. Go to a great school. Go to a great church. And if you don't apply it, it's of no benefit. So I want to leave you guys today as we kind of close this out with some challenges to, to, to authority in Scripture. And since Sola Scriptura is a doctrine of the Reformation, we'll start with the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church, they elevate traditions and bishops and popes as the same authority of Scripture. Right? Martin Luther cried out, there is nothing inerrant except for the, except for the Bible. There is no inerrant pope. They wanted to burn him at the stake. 
What about our culture? So the Roman Catholic Church is an easy one. It's an easy target. We, we get that. If you've studied history. But what about culture? You know, the Word of God is emphasized less and less in church, in churches, where the people more, look more and more like the culture around them. Right? Churches don't take stand on gay marriage, homosexual activities, gender issues, abortion. Those are the big ones. But also worldliness and pride. Churches don't take a stand on the scriptures because culture has influenced them. Right? They elevate cultural norms to the same level as scripture or even reinterpret scripture. We see that with egalitarianism. There's no such thing as the headship principle in Scripture. We don't have to follow that. What about social gospel ministries? I mean, the Salvation Army, even though Salvation is not a church, still a great example in a sense, the Salvation Army was started to do gospel ministry in inner cities. What happened? The culture influenced them, and they became more concerned about alleviating the, the, the poor and helping the poor than actually sharing the gospel. And now the only thing I see the Salvation Army does is they have op shops here in Australia. I'm not saying they don't do other ministries. But it's social gospel influence. It's less than, less scriptural influence. They accept as something as culture is more important. There's also experience. Experience is an attack on the sufficiency of scripture. Uh, they elevate personal experience as having the same authority. We see that in the charismatic movement. If I don't go to church and, and feel this wonderful experience, then I'm not worship God. I haven't worshiped God. You see elevation of visions and dreams and feelings and emotions over everything else. <laughs> Brother, there's so many times we read Scripture and, and you're going to hear a sermon and, and Holy Spirit's going to work convicting you or encouraging you and you're going to feel joy and you're going to be, you're going to be deeply encouraged. And there's so many times when the emotions just might not be there. Does that mean the Word of God is not powerful? No. Maybe your heart's just not accepting it. You're indifferent, rebellious, resistant. John Christendom was a pastor in the 4th century. I ran across this quote last week, and I thought it was a great quote. He says, in regard to the apostles, they all agreed to entrust Stephen and his followers with the care of widows that they might devote themselves to the ministry of the Word. We know the story in Acts. But he says, he continues, of course, we shouldn't be so eager for the word if we had the resources of miracles. But as there is not so much left as a trace of that power, and we still have many persistent enemies around us, it remains necessary for us to arm ourselves with the defense of the word. This is the fourth century. He says there's no trace of miracles and healings left. He said, we have to defend ourselves. He's talking about the church. We have to be Christians. We have to defend ourselves with the word. So not only do you have challenges to the sufficiency of God's word from the Roman Catholic Church, from, from culture, from experience, but also in our culture today, psychology is huge. Psychology is a basic premise is that men and women are good. I study psychology. The basic premise is men and women are good. That emotions and behaviors that people exhibit are based fully and finally out of nature or nurture. Nature is the genetics, or you have a biological disposition to something, or nurture is your environmental factors, uh, familial, like family issues, or socioeconomic issues determine your behavior, how you think, how you feel, and how you act. Now, I'm not saying that those aren't factors in our lives. But the main issue for every man, woman, and child is the sinful human heart. And apart from regeneration, we're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. So the goal of psychological treatment is psychotherapy 
Right? Call it, you talk about things as if just talking about them makes them better, but you talk about things, or even medications. The goal of medications and psychotherapy is a modification of behavior and, and what? The swage of guilt or the removal of those feelings. But what's not happened, what's not happened is the issues in the human heart haven't been dealt with. And the Bible speaks to the issues of the human heart. The Bible goes to the root. Psychology deals with the surface. Tell me how many times you, I've counseled people, when we, whether it's anxiety or fear or depression or, or issues that stem from you know, abuse when they were younger as children. You, you deal with some of those, those effects. Well, first of all, you go through and say, well, have you been redeemed? Has your heart been changed? And, and if you have the Holy Spirit... Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome sin and the domination of sin. We call it, psychology calls it addiction. Bible says that, that you're being mastered by sin and dominated by sin. And if you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you can break that domination. And I've seen it. In Grace Community, there was a great class. I had friends of mine that taught it. It's called the Hope Class. And they had hundreds of people in there that they were helping to overcome life-dominating issues. Everything from homosexuality to drug addictions of various kinds. You see, Scripture speaks to the fundamental issue of the human heart. We always go back to the, the fundamental issues. Right? Why are you fearful? Why are you depressed? Why do you have anxiety? Why are you angry? What are the issues? The scripture deals with those issues. Psychology deals with the surface. And so what you have is you have a whole generation, unfortunately, of Christians that they don't go to pastors or they don't look to the word. They don't look to wise counselors. Their immediate thing is, well, I need to go to a secular counselor and, and have someone help me. Now, I'm not saying that everything in psychology from an observational standpoint is bad. There's much that, that I've taken a psychology class. I took a developmental psychology class. It was really interesting about the way people behave in different aspects of their lives. Right? All, they, you know, all they've done is they've looked at observationally how people act in different ages. That's just helpful information. But it ultimately can lead us to deny the sufficiency of Scripture. We don't think that Scripture... And God's word applies to us in every situation of our life. Brother, we, we've been given the mind of Christ. God's word is sufficient for all aspects of our lives. We have to understand there's a, first of all, a spiritual battle. It's God's word versus the lies of Satan. God, Satan attacks the truthfulness of Scripture, the effectiveness of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture. Is it sufficient for what we need in this moment, or do we need more? Will we stand in judgment on Scripture and evaluate it based on human reasoning like Eve did? Or will we submit to it? We also need to understand that it's beneficial. It's good for you. It's, it's good for you in that it helps you to mature and it equips you for life. So much of my own struggles, I'll be honest, some of my own struggles in my life, in my 20s, was because I did not know Scripture, and I did not know how to apply the Scripture that I did know. Peter's preaching on wisdom. What is wisdom? The application of Scripture. And that's where we have help. We have brothers and sisters in the Lord that can come alongside us and teach us and help us. Women's ministry can guide you and help you. Older ladies that have lived longer or have been able to apply God's word longer. You have elders, you have pastors. Right? Our desire is to help you. Scripture is beneficial. But scripture also helps us to praise all things. As Paul says, the natural man, when he appraises the world, he will always come to the wrong conclusions. Right? Don't accept those wrong conclusions. Just because someone with a degree or a measure of authority says it, evaluate it scripturally. What, what does God's word teach us about geology, the dinosaurs? Creation, 
molecular science, right? How do we interpret the data in light of what we know to be true? Right. No, I'm going to create detail about dinosaurs and creation, but there are plenty of resources. Creation Research Institute, Answers in Genesis, I talk about geology. Brother, Scripture, Scripture is beneficial, but Scripture also helps us to praise all things. Right? Scripture is sufficient for you to live your life and honor God and glorify Him. We end with Isaiah 40. Verse 8. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, as we looked at passages this morning that speak of the sufficiency of Scripture. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, which is powerful, that works individually in our lives, conforming us to the image of Christ. We thank you that it's beneficial, it's good for us, that it equips us for life, that it is what we need in this moment. We have what we need. Lord, we thank you that we have the truth. Lord, I pray that as we appraise the world around us, Lord, that we would evaluate the world in light of the truth, your word. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom to apply the word of God to our lives, to look at our own hearts and our behaviors. Lord, help us to submit to it. Help us to be humble enough to ask for help when we have issues, knowing that iron sharpens iron. That your word, or you've given us your word and you've given us ministers of your word. Lord, we thank you again for this time together as your people. We thank you again for your word and praise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That ends our, our time together around the word this morning. I pray that uh, for the rest of the day, you have a good, and good, godly day and a great week. I'll see you guys next week. God bless you.